All right, hey everyone, we will get started in about two minutes here. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm excited for this. Uh, I believe everything's working. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I can hear myself talking. And looks like I can. There we go. Looks like you guys can hear me talking. If you can't hear me, uh, try refreshing the stream. Uh, sometimes things get kind of locked up, clogged up, uh, and refreshing uh, the page helps. So. Uh, I'm excited for this. Again, we'll get started in about two minutes. Let me know where you're watching from, what you currently are on the uh, We'll see you guys here in a second. Thanks, guys. excited for tonight. Uh, this is uh, something I really enjoy uh, talking about uh, and it's something I talk about quite a bit and uh, that's using Ableton Live to automate stuff. So like I mentioned in the beginning, if you're just joining me one, hey, my name is Will. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's always fun to spend a couple hours, well, not a couple hours, uh, just one hour tonight, but it's always fun to spend some time uh, with you guys. Uh, this is going to be a blast tonight. As I mentioned in the intro, um, let me know, one, where you're watching from, and two, what you're currently automating. Uh, looks like Marcelo says he's here from Argentina. Marcelo, welcome. Um, currently controlling multitracks and vocal processing for different artists. Awesome. Uh, Joan Jazzy. Jonah uh, is from here, uh, here f uh, from Nigeria. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Jonah, uh, pro presenter, still trying to get on automating lights. Awesome. Uh, Les, uh, Les is here. Les is always here. And I always make a terrible joke about wishing uh, I was in Hawaii where Les is. Uh, Jacob's working full automation, but just starting currently running loops with it. Chris. Uh, hey, Chris. Chris is here from Athens looking into automating lights and pro presenter with Ableton at his church. Um, Aaron is here and making jokes, trying to get me uh, to throw me off and trying to get me to laugh, but I will not do that. So a couple things up front here. I, again, I'm super excited for this uh, one up front. Thanks so much to my friends at Clark for making this happen. Um, you can uh, check them out and visit them at Clark.is. I'm going to throw a link to that in the notes uh, in the chat here. Uh, if you are, especially a few of you have mentioned you're at churches particularly and you're looking to do automation stuff, um, if you are building a new room, you're redoing a room, I would encourage you to reach out to my friends at Clark. <clears throat> They've been, uh, one, incredibly supportive of me, which one I'm thankful for. That's not why I'm encouraging you to reach out to them. But if you're redoing a room, uh, you're building a new room, um, you're just trying to refit stuff for your room that you currently have reach out to Clark. They are AV integrators. Um, they do a great job of looking at your room, looking at what you hope to do um, and, and finding gear that fits exactly what you're looking to do, especially tonight as we talk about the connected stage and connecting things together, controlling uh, production elements, controlling things on stage. Uh, <clears throat> you need gear that's going to talk to each other, that's going to work well with each other. So again, thanks to Clark uh, for sponsoring this, but they're sponsoring the whole first season of the new podcast. If you haven't checked out the podcast yet, head to from studiostage.com slash podcast. Uh, you can find it pretty much anywhere where podcasts are. Uh, <clears throat> all right, that's enough promotion of my stuff. Uh, a couple notes here up front. As often, uh, as I mentioned, as always when we do webinars, this is going to be recorded. So if you have to leave, don't worry. I know some of you have rehearsals on Wednesday, which is odd because you should have a rehearsal on Thursday. Just kidding. But I know some of you are having rehearsals uh, and you have to leave. That's perfectly fine. Um, some of you are eating dinner. Some of you are about to go to sleep. Whatever time zone you're in, 
Um, uh, glad you're here. If you have to leave, don't worry. It's being recorded. You're going to get a link first thing in the morning to the replay. So if you're on this and have not registered for the webinar, you might be watching this and going, why do I need to register for the webinar? Two main uh, reasons. One, tomorrow morning, you're going to get a link to the replay. Uh, you can also find that if you just um, watch the link that you're currently watching on. Uh, the replay, this will basically turn into a replay immediately. But make sure you've registered um, as well from studiostage.com slash live. You can also find the registration link in the comments there. Uh, that's going to get you the link to the replay as well as a special discount I'm going to share only by email for those of you watching uh, to the site. So make sure you're registered. Uh, if you want to chat, ask questions live in the chat, uh, post them in the chat. Um, uh, I enjoy interacting with people during the webinar. It doesn't throw me off. There'll be times where I'll say, okay, hold on for that question. We'll get to it in a moment. Um, but ask as many questions as you want. So tonight's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm, this is a topic, again, that I talk about often and I really enjoy. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to monitor the chat uh, and have YouTube up, so I should be able to see any questions that you guys have. I'm also going to share links about the webinar, uh, but if you miss a link or I mention something and I don't happen uh, to post the link, I'm not able to post the link, don't worry, don't fret, uh, because I'm going to share my notes from this webinar with you. Again, uh, tomorrow you'll get a link to that, so make sure you're registered. So what in the world are we talking about? Why in the world are we all here in the first place? Not what's our purpose uh, on this planet. But why are we here for this webinar here tonight? So the goal tonight uh, is to talk about how to uh, connect and control almost anything with Ableton Live. So, <clears throat> again, this is something I've talked a lot about uh, really over the past six, seven years. Uh, even this year, uh, I posted a video of me showing uh, how to control my coffee pot with Ableton Live, which was a complete real deal. Uh, coffee pot's still connected. I haven't controlled it with Ableton Live uh, recently, but <clears throat> I talk about controlling lots of stuff with Ableton Live. It's questions I get all the time. Typically, the question goes something like this. Hey, Will, I'm trying to control my X lighting console. Uh, I'm trying to control Jan's Vista. I'm trying to control my ETC Ion. I got that question this week, actually. Um, I'm trying to control ProPresenter. I'm trying to control Resolume. I'm trying to control Main Stage, my Nord, my, my Eventide Time Factor, whatever it is. Uh, I'm trying to control this thing. Can Ableton control it? That's kind of the question I get often. The goal of this webinar is to, obviously, I don't have, I have a lot of gear. I'm fortunate I'm sitting next to a Play Audio 12, a Mio 4, a MIDI 4 Plus that I'm going to show here in a moment. But I don't have every guitar pedal. I don't have every keyboard. I wish I did, but I don't. So we're not going to talk through every specific piece of gear. But instead, what I'm going to do is show you kind of the framework I use. There's really two things you need to know if you're going to go and use Ableton Live to control stuff. So you need to know uh, what type of, uh, I call it Ableton Live control types. What types of things that Ableton Live um, sends natively or can send using plugins. So we're going to talk about those control types. And then two, you need to just know how to literally connect Ableton Live to those certain things. And we're going to talk about that as well, too. So again, primarily, we're going to talk about how to co uh, connect and control things with Ableton Live. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of looking at our control types and then making the connection between Ableton and different things. Why does this matter? Really quickly, I always think it's important to tie what we're talking about to a why, because otherwise, what's the point? What's in it for us? So one. Um, it allows us to perform in sync and in time. Now, not in sync like Justin Timberlake, but it allows us to perform when we're all together. We're all on the same page. So we can send tempo from Ableton to main stage to sync our ARPs up. We could send tempo from Ableton to, uh, to our Nord to sync our ARPs up. We could send tempo uh, from Ableton to our delay pedal uh, to sync our tempos up. We could change pages on our chart app, on OnSong, on Music Stand, if you happen to use those and use charts on stage. So many different possibilities, but uh, it's one of the things I really love about this is it allows us to kind of all stay on the same page and in sync uh, at the same time. Second thing, it allows us to focus on the performance. Now, here's kind of the ironic thing about tonight. We're going to talk a lot about tech. You know, everything we talk about, we're not really talking about being artistic tonight. We're talking about tech, but here's the thing. We're going to focus a little bit on the tech tonight, or maybe let's say this even better. We're going to focus a lot on the tech tonight so that you could focus on the tech very little uh, and, and hopefully uh, at all, uh, not at all, 
uh, when you're on stage. I want you to focus on your performance. Now, if you're here watching this as a worship leader, someone today coming on a post and said, you know, worship isn't performance. Call it whatever you want to. If you're on stage as a worship leader, if you're um, in a club um, uh, playing with your band, if you're on a stage in a coliseum, in a stadium playing, no matter what it is, I want to show you how you can learn this tech well so that you don't have to focus on the tech while you're on stage. Um, practically, you could change presets on your keyboard. You could change presets on your guitar pedal so that you could focus on playing, you could focus on playing keys, um, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, focus on that so you don't have to focus on the tech. You don't have to focus on changing presets. You don't have to focus on, are the lights going to be right? Uh, another practical application of this and a reason of learning this is you can have your lights always be perfect. Your lyrics always be perfect. Your videos always be perfect. Do the work once and it's perfectly in time every single time. Andre says, hi from Brazil. Hello, Andre. You guys have great coffee there. I miss Brazilian coffee. Uh, currently automating pro presenter and PVP. Awesome. Uh, so we, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some stuff you can do only in PVP rather than a few other pieces of software. Here's the third thing. This is what I'm particularly passionate about. Um, and for those of you watching this now, is it's job security. Now, so let's just talk very practically. Um, if you are a guitar player in a band, you bring value to that band. You bring value to uh, the, the group of people, the band you're in, the music you're creating by playing guitar. So hopefully you're an excellent guitar player. You know your skill, your craft really well. That's great. That's very important. You got to have something that you specialize in that you continue to work and build your skill. But I think it's really important to have additional skills. So if you're in a band, maybe you are really good at organization. You're really good at event planning. So you can kind of become the tour manager. You could help coordinate everything. Job security for me, something I'm very passionate about talking about over really the past two to three years more and more is this idea of being and becoming a playback tech. If you're not familiar with a playback tech, that's essentially someone who controls uh, tracks, uh, maybe controls things via MIDI for a band, either off stage or on stage as a music director or playing an instrument. If you could be an incredible guitar player, you're going to get gigs. If you could be an incredible guitar player who knows Ableton, you're going to get even more gigs because so, so many people are playing with tracks. Doesn't matter type of music, doesn't matter the venue, they're probably playing with tracks. So it's important to have that skill as a, on an instrument or as an audio engineer and have the ability to be a playback tech as well too. But let's expand that even further. Let's go beyond just being able to press play in Ableton. And there's a lot behind that. We've talked about that in previous webinars. I talk a lot about that in tutorials and courses. But if we even go beyond that, you could start going, okay, hey, the lead singer plays keyboard. Let's mention to her, let's make your job even easier. Let's make sure that uh, every single uh, night when we play and your fingers hit the keys, the exact sound at the exact right tempo is going to be available to you immediately and you have to do no work. How much more valuable does that make you as an incredible guitar player, someone who's a music director that gets Ableton, um, and someone that can make the performance for the lead person even easier? Expand that to lights, expand that to lyrics, expand that to video. Hopefully you're getting this. This is job security. And again, I don't care if you're working in a church. I don't care if you're on the road as a monitor engineer and you can also do uh, playback tech. You can also do and get this automation stuff. This opens up tons and tons of possibilities. Uh, you could connect almost anything to Ableton Live to make that happen. So um, let's get into it. I've talked for far too long. Uh, again, as a reminder, if you have to leave, you'll get the, the links in, um, uh, in my notes in the replay uh, email. So make sure you're registered using the link uh, below there. So let's start with <coughs> kind of just talking through uh, what Ableton can natively send, a couple different control types. And we're gonna breeze through this fairly quickly. Um, we're gonna talk through this and, uh, and just kind of talk through again, what Ableton can do and what Ableton uh, needs a little help with from other plugins to make happen. So I'm going to try to share this link. Let's see if this works. There we go. So um, a lot of this material I'm pulling from is from my Ableton Live Control Types course, which I just posted the link to in the chat there. But let's start here at the top. So essentially, when we talk about control types, and here's kind of, let me even back up before then. Here's the way I want you to apply everything I'm about to say and apply everything we talk about tonight. You walk on stage. Again, I go back to people saying, um, can Ableton control this light console? Uh, Andre talked about controlling ProPresenter PVP. Can Ableton control ProPresenter PVP? 
what you need to do is open the manual for that software for that hardware and see what does that software and hardware accept what control type is it MIDI notes is it MIDI CC MIDI PC we're going to talk about all those uh, MIDI show control <coughs> what does this does it accept then you have to think through okay does Ableton send that natively do I need some extra plugin do I need some uh, in between some workaround to, to make that happen then you connect Ableton to that device whether you're sending MIDI or audio and then magic happens right so that's kind of the goal what we're talking about so first we have to understand the different control types that are possible um, and the, the the different things Ableton can or cannot send uh, and then we'll talk about how to connect it all before I do that let me know in the chats uh, the chat not the chats let me know in the chat what version of Ableton Live you're using 9 10 are you using intro standard suite did a video a couple weeks ago talking about the different editions of Ableton. We now call them editions, not versions, and what I think is best for us. So let me know in the chat before we move on um, what edition you are using. Jacob's using Standard 10. Marcelo's using Sweet 10. Cool. Two people on 10. That's good. I'm a big fan of 10 and the improvements. Um, the Flash is using Standard 9. Chris is using Standard 10. Um, so again, let me know in the comments there uh, what version of Ableton you are using. Okay, so let's get to this. Very first type, uh, oh, control type I want to talk about. It's probably the most obvious, uh, but that's MIDI notes, okay? So that's the thing we're most familiar working with. If you have a MIDI controller, you're playing notes in Ableton Live, you are capturing um, notes, uh, you're playing MIDI notes. If you're sending notes out of Ableton Live, you're doing that as well too. Janet, hey Janet. Uh, Janet is using Sweet 10. Jared, man, he, uh, oh, I thought, I misread Jared's and thought he was saying he was using Sweet 9 and 10. Uh, Jared is using Sweet 9.6.1. Thank you for the specific specificity in that. I don't know if that's even a word, if I said that right. But Jared's using Sweet 9. A lot of people are using Sweet. That's really cool. Uh, Dustin is using, from Cincinnati, automating Ableton for tracks and presenting using Ableton Sweet 10. He knocked out all the answers at once. So thank you, Dustin. Okay, so let's get to it. Mini notes. Uh, again, this is the thing we're all used to um, uh, to working with and doing, but I want to just talk through a few specifics of this in Ableton Live. So one, when it comes to sending Ableton uh, MIDI notes out of Ableton Live, this is the way I like to do it. One, um, you know, I create templates in session view where I save all this, but essentially the way I would do this is I would double click, not in an audio track, but in a MIDI track here, uh, to create a clip. And then I would rename this clip Command R, uh, which is renamed Control R if you're on a PC. Um, I would rename this clip and call this maybe, let's say, Preset 1. So I'm assuming the hardware the software that i want to control accepts midi notes so i'm going to send a midi note here so preset one now if i want to send a midi note there's a couple different uh values a couple different things that that uh, go down the pipeline if you will whenever you hit a midi note on a midi controller one is the note itself right so i'm hitting c2 right and c2 is just a numbering system for the lower the numbers the lower on the keyboard uh, I think C0 is, is uh, or is it C4 is middle C? Someone let me know in the comments. I can't remember. But basically we have uh, C0, then C negative 1, C negative 2. It's tricky, but depending on the software you're using, they might see middle C as a different note. So for instance, Ableton's uh, lowest note is C minus 2. Some software will see that as C minus 1. So then you go up. So C minus 2, C minus 1, 0, blah, blah, blah. Let me practically show you what that is, what that looks like. So this mini note, if I scroll down here, you can see the bottom most uh, mini note. And let's get my ugly mug out of here. Stand by. There we go. Bottom most uh, mini note in this clip is C minus two. If I want to create a mini note, the way I like doing this is double clicking. And then this is just purely a personal preference thing. But I drag this note to be the entire length of the clip. And, and this is the reason I do that. When I bring this over into arrangement view, uh, eventually here, um, one, I want to see a, a note that fills the entire length of the clip. To me, and this is just purely OCD. It has no bearing on the performance of this. When I see this, uh, something's just a little unnerving to me. Something that is a, a little like, uh, I think that's going to work. I hope that's going to work. But when I see it fill the entire thing, I go, okay, I know it's going to work. We're good. Okay. So uh, this is essentially what our MIDI note looks like. So when I create my mini note, again, a couple pieces of information that I have that are happening here. One, um, I have the note itself. So in this case, if we look at this example, C minus two. 
Now, whenever I create a MIDI note, I have a note on message, which is essentially when you press the key or at the beginning of this clip. And then when I let go, I have a note off message. So we have our actual note name. We have our note on. We have our note off message. Uh, two other pieces of information that's carried along with this. Next, we have our velocity. For those of you using uh, ProPresenter, uh, controlling ProPresenter, you're very familiar with this velocity thing. Uh, because we use velocity, or they call it uh, intensity, I think, at ProPresenter. We use velocity to determine what playlist, what slide, what uh, specific cue we're using in ProPresenter. Uh, velocity is how hard or soft we hit a note. In Ableton, we define uh, velocity this way. One, you can click on a note. Uh, you can move this little handle up and down here, right? What I like doing, though, is putting my mouse over the note, holding command. I get this. You can kind of see it. It's like a... A line with an arrow up an arrow down and I drag down drag up and that defines the velocity of this how do we practically apply all this info so I have a delay pedal let's say it accepts MIDI notes for presets it probably accepts program changes we'll get to that in a second but let's say it accepts MIDI notes the way I apply this is go okay what MIDI note is this okay so it says C minus 2 equals preset 1 great so what I'm gonna do is create my clip I go down here to C minus 2 I've created my note um, and then maybe it says, okay, your velocity has to be 64 for this to work. That'd be very particular and bad UX, but let's say that it, it, it is that. So I'm just going to drag down to 64, uh, and we're going to make this happen. There we go, 64. Oh, where is it? There we go. So mini note, C minus 2, 64. Now, what if I want to continue this up, and it says the velocity has to stay at 64, uh, and I just need to increase notes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to duplicate this clip. Preset one, now preset two, let's rename it. And then I'm just gonna move this note up. So that's essentially for me, how I'm working with MIDI notes. So that's one control type that we have. Uh, I'm gonna save, create a template. We'll talk about that a bit in our control types course. We'll talk about that um, in further later in other moments. But essentially what I would do is hit save on this and call this MIDI notes template. Put this on our desktop here real quick. And then the way I'm going to work with this is just open a new file. Um, and then I'm going to go here to my desktop and I'm going to say, okay, mini notes template. Oh, we got to wait for this to sync up. Uh, something I've noticed with live 10 is sometimes the file doesn't fully sync up all the way. Let's see if I get out of it. And if it refreshes, uh, where's our little refresh thing? I think it's here. Nope. Let's just do this. Move from sidebar. Uh, if you don't know how to do this, check out the video about a month ago where I talk about using Live's browser, one of the biggest time-saving things. Um, if someone wants to be fancy and find that on the channel and link that up in the comments, you get extra points. Um, all right, it's not refreshing for me, so let's do this. Let's close it, pay no attention to uh, the article reference behind this, uh, and let's reopen and let's see if it finds it. All right, there we go. And it's still not finding it. So that's the joy of doing things live. Sometimes you don't see it. Essentially what I would do, uh, I would get that uh, file. Um, I'd have the, the template over to the left there. And then I would, there we go. I would drag the cues in just like this. I would expand it. You see preset one, preset two. Um, and then I'd lay everything out against the timeline. Preset one, preset two. That's how I'd use my mini notes. I think that's one of the key things. I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but I think one of the things that's key um, to doing this efficiently is building a template like this. So figure out what your presets are. I was talking to, uh, who was it? I was talking to someone the other day. Um, goodness, I can't remember who it was. Someone in the, a subscriber in the course. And they were talking about doing this with keys presets. Um, and I just mentioned to them, you know, as we're talking through stuff, I said, hey, how are you managing your presets? And they said, oh, I build a template and then I drag from that template into arrangement view and save it against the song. That's really, really key. Don't go in and every time you do a song, create a new clip, move things up. Just sit down one day where you're watching Netflix or something, create all these clips, save it in templates. And then just like I did uh, here, <coughs> drag from your browser. Hopefully it works for you. Uh, uh, unlike it did for me, so it shows up automatically, and then drag that into the timeline uh, right against the timeline there. Okay, so that's a look at MIDI notes. Probably the the easiest thing, the thing we already probably do, um, and it's probably the most, uh, or excuse me, probably the least common thing when it comes to automating and controlling stuff, but it's still important to know. Next thing I want to talk about is MIDI CCs. I was just talking to someone earlier, 
maybe it was you, Jacob. I can't remember. But was mentioning some. No, it wasn't Jacob. It was someone on my uh, Facebook wall. I can't remember who it is. Too many people, too long of a week. Um, was talking about MIDI CCs, and they said, "Yeah, I want to move to doing this uh, with using MIDI CCs, but I'm not sure how to do this." Uh, and I can't remember their name, and I can't remember who it was exactly. It was not Jacob, in fact. But um, hopefully, he's watching this webinar. So uh, here's what we do when it comes to MIDI CCs. Again, I've got a MIDI track here loaded up. This is how MIDI CCs work in Ableton Live. Going to double click, create a MIDI note. Um, I'm going to hit the envelopes box over here. If you don't see this, make sure you um, open up the notes box there, or envelopes box there. And then I could do MIDI control. And then you see all these different CCs. So when it comes to CCs, essentially <coughs> what we have is our parameter and then we have a value. So what I mean by this is, uh, let's say I'm just going to pick anything here, CC14. I'm going to just rename this CC14. Then I have a value. Uh, I could double click here to create a breakpoint, zero. And then let's increase this click and increase that. So I basically have the parameter, which is right now CC14. Don't think CC necessarily aligns to something. Now there are some standards like, uh, was it CC7 equals volume? So almost any piece of MIDI gear, if it follows kind of the general MIDI spec, in the world, if you send it CC7, you're going to control volume for that piece of gear automatically, which is really, really cool. So if you look at a piece of gear, uh, and you'll see this a lot of times when you were doing some sort of uh, change of a control, hence MIDI CC control change. That's why we call it that. <coughs> you'll see to where it says, okay, MIDI CC14 gives you control over delay feedback. And then what you do is say, okay, I'm going to choose MIDI CC. And then I'm going to increase the value um, on my clip, maybe going a, a range. Or if it just needs to be CC, like we want um, uh, we want this parameter, uh, CC14, but I want it to be at this particular, at 100. Then what I would do is just basically do this. I create one breakpoint, and you see, let's get my ugly mug out of the way. Uh, and you just see, basically, CC14 is our parameter, and our value is 100. And that's now saved into our clip. And again, save thing, uh, same thing as I mentioned before. I'm going to create a template, save those with that. So that gets us MIDI notes, MIDI CC. Um, let's talk about one more thing or a couple more MIDI things. And then we're going to go into live's preferences here really quickly. Um, all right. Doing great on time here. So let's talk about uh, that's MIDI CCs. Again, you're going to typically find that when it comes to changing values right to automating delay time to automating feedback to automating the intensity of this fader in your lighting console that's typically what's going to use cc and again midi notes midi cc can all be sent um, natively from ableton you don't need a plugin to make that happen uh, next let's talk about program changes again something that not a lot of people do uh, and that's kind of the mystical bit of this where people go, man, I don't understand it, I don't get it, and it seems far off in distance, uh, in, in the distance, but it's not all that tricky. So uh, let's delete this clip. Let's create a new one, and we're gonna call this program change one, okay? Now, um, and another thing while we're doing this, let me share this article, so you guys got a peek at this article earlier. Um, I'm gonna share this in the comments here, one second. Um, if you guys haven't seen any of these articles, so I write pretty much regularly weekly article for Sweetwater. Some months we skip a week or it takes a little bit to get posted or it takes a little bit to write. But if you head over to Sweetwater, uh, click on the NSYNC tab, uh, I-N-S, anyway, you know how to spell sync, not NSYNC the band. Again, use that joke earlier. But click on that tab. Uh, the category is worship, which sometimes it is specific to church and worship stuff. Sometimes it has nothing to do with a specific category like worship like this article where I talk about taking control of your keys rig using Ableton Live. Um, so this is a great article where I talk about some of the stuff we're going to talk through now. Keep that as reference. Um, let me know in the chat if you are controlling your keyboard as in a hardware keyboard. I'm just looking through uh, from what people said. It looks like I don't think anyone said they're controlling their keyboard yet. Uh, so let me know if you happen to be doing that or if that's something you're interested in doing in the future. Uh, then we will um, uh, just interested to know. So let's talk about program changes. Now, program changes typically used when we talk about presets, whether it's hardware, whether it's software, uh, whether it's a, a Nord keyboard, if it's main stage, if it's 
um, uh, something like um, uh, uh, preset on a delay pedal. Typically, when we talk about presets, I want you to think of program change, PC, program change, not personal computer, political correctness, uh, program change. It's the greater of all the PCs. Uh, so program change, and typically what program change means is, hey, I want to change this preset on this hardware device, on this software device. Uh, doesn't typically matter if it's hardware or software. A few specific things we need to know, though, when we talk about this in the context of Ableton Live. So here we go. Uh, Dustin says, talking to our keyboard player about it, working process. Yeah, um, and one of the, I, I guess one of the, the points here on this when it comes to the program change thing, changing keyboard presets, really changing anyone's presets is you gotta have the buy-in of your players. Now, you may have the benefit of being the music director for your band, being able to call the shots, maybe it's hired guns and you say, all right, as someone who's gonna join this band, you're gonna know we're gonna program all our, our preset changes and use program changes from Ableton to make this happen. It might be in a church situation where you're working with volunteers, uh, it's their gear, they don't have time to come in during the week to make this happen. Uh, you'll need to get some buy-in from them as to why this is beneficial. It's going to take some time to work with them to, to get them to understand when to change presets on their pedals at the exact right times, all that fun stuff. Uh, again, I don't know if I mentioned this. Post comments, uh, questions uh, in the chat if you guys have any as we go. Uh, so program changes. So we're going to double-click on our clip. Um, and again, as we create clips, all we're doing is just double-clicking over here in session view to create those. Um, <clears throat> so I've got my clip created and what I want to do is go to my notes box. So if you don't see your notes box, look down here in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, super easy to find, use just the musical notation icon there and click that to open up the notes box. And what you're going to see down here in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen says program change and we see bank, sub and program. Now I have to admit I've controlled a lot of stuff using program changes for years and years and years and not until about a year ago, probably even less than that, did I fully understand what each of those three boxes mean. So for reference, uh, I'm gonna pull up this article here so you guys can see this because we got something plugged in here. So when it comes to program changes, there's three terms that you should know. Um, MSB, which is most significant byte. LSB, uh, least significant byte. And then finally PC is our program change. So the way Ableton Live does this, um, let me go back over to our CCs. And I don't want to confuse anyone because this is pretty confusing. But let's look through. Let's see if I can find it. I can't remember what number. Uh, one second here. Okay. 30. You probably, maybe you've looked at this and gone, I don't think, uh, I don't think Ableton can count the company. Because if you look at this, 30, 31, where the heck is 32? Right. I don't know if you've ever looked through this list of CCs and gone 30, 31, 33. Where the heck is 32? Uh, if I remember correctly, CC 32 is typically tied to program change. Um, and so that's how you, you make that happen in some other softwares. The way Ableton does it is maybe a little confusing, but it's kind of more straightforward in a sense because all my program changes are handled here in this tab. So the way you're going to do this is you're going to look in your manual and your manual is going to say, uh, use CC, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. It's going to say most significant byte uh, is CC32. <coughs> You're going to go into that first box there. Let's go into it here. Bank 32. I'm going to hit, her, uh, hit enter so that it, uh, that changes to 32. And then it's going to say sub bank uh, or LSB, least significant byte, will be 31. I'm just picking numbers here, arbitrary numbers. And then it's going to say, okay, Programs 0 to 127 are your presets within that. So here's what you're going to do. And I mentioned this in this article if you want to look back through this um, and, and kind of dive in a little deeper. Is one, you're going to look in your manual and see, okay, what is my MSB? What's my most significant byte? What's my least significant byte? LSB. Enter those numbers in those boxes and then use PC tab to change it. Now, most likely what's going to happen, the first time you do this, I can almost guarantee with about 95% certainty, it's not going to work. The reason is because of the way Ableton handles CCs, because of the way Ableton handles MIDI notes, um, sometimes these numbers are off or offset by one. Uh, I think most times I've seen them, excuse me, being offset by a value of one. So here's what you do. If it says most significant byte uh, or bit uh, of 32, 
then it's very likely that's either actually 33 or 31. Adjust it, try it. Once it works, then you know, okay, adjust MSB, LSB, you know, in either direction, and then program change is going to give you and toggle those presets. So what I would do, uh, I worked with um, a guy's an MD, a playback tech, uh, for a couple different artists, uh, and he was trying to get his, his keyboard rig completely controlled by Ableton. And we talked about uh, three different rolling keyboards. <coughs> All of them use different LS MSB, LSB uh, information and all we did to basically get it to work is open the manual up and go, okay, it says MSB this, LSB we entered it in, didn't work. We adjusted offset by I think one, a value of one. Instantly started working, he had all his presets in there. Similar to what we talked about before, when you go into this, uh, when you figure out what those are, so you figure out preset one is program change one, whatever the value is behind the scenes, you're gonna change, you're gonna rename that and say, okay, this is keys preset one. And I would name it however you want to, you're going to save an entire file like that template, and then you're going to drag from your browser into your file in Arrangement View to make that happen. Uh, a couple questions here. Sean says, um, uh, do you know if any eDrums can receive program change info? Sean, very likely, uh, because uh, anything that's MIDI that accepts presets very, very likely is going to set, accept program changes if they do that. Um, best way to figure this out is Google your product and say manual, and then do a command F or control F to search the PDF to find MIDI. And it's going to give you a list of all that. And it's again, going to say, uh, you know, program change, most significant byte is this least significant byte is this PC is that, uh, Sean also says it's going to probably control main stage patches when we switch our keys to main stage simulates. Also probably for a middle school music retreat this summer. Awesome. Sean, if you're doing that, check out the video I, I have, on this YouTube channel of using Ableton Live to control main stage. We also have a template for this that's available to subscribers um, on the site. So that's how we do program changes. A couple, through, uh, a couple more really quickly I'm going to run through, um, and then uh, we'll get to some other fun stuff. Uh, so when it comes to MIDI clock, typically when we talk about tempo, and we're syncing uh, tempo on our Nord, syncing tempo uh, on our delay pedal, we need to send MIDI clock. Now, I want to very... Uh, importantly stress MIDI clock is not the same thing as MIDI show control MIDI clock is not the same thing as time code MIDI clock is not MIDI time code if you've heard some of those phrases if you're hearing these for the first time sorry to confuse you MIDI clock is tempo information right here's how we send it from Ableton uh, and this is going to get us into kind of our final MIDI segment here that I want to talk about so over in Ableton let's go to our preferences command comma we're going to go to our link MIDI tab and let's talk about sending MIDI clock uh, from Ableton to control a, a timeline, a time factor, a Nord, whatever it is. What we're gonna do is we wanna go down to the output section and however we are sending MIDI from our uh, laptop to that device, we wanna go to that output. So if we're using network session, I would go here. If we're using the IC driver, I would go here. If I'm using my Audio 4 Plus, maybe I'm using the host port for this and it's connected. Perfect, that's great. So what I'm gonna do is go, if I'm sending MIDI clock, I'm gonna go here and hit sync. And what that means is that's going to send MIDI clock out of Ableton Live to that device. A Couple other things you may need to know about that. Uh, MIDI clock type, we have song and pattern. I always leave that just set to song. Uh, but essentially, again, when I do that, that is going to send MIDI clock from Ableton into uh, whatever that device is. Now, typically on um, almost every device I've ever sync to Ableton, you have to go somewhere in the um, in the settings and say receive tempo data, receive MIDI clock on this MIDI channel um, and uh, from this input typically. So a couple other things while we're here in this MIDI preferences tab that I want to talk about. Um, when we're sending sync information or MIDI clock from Ableton, we want to make sure that sync is enabled. When we're sending MIDI notes uh, from um, a track in Ableton, we want to make sure that track is on. Basically, track for that output means, okay, I'm sending um, uh, MIDI notes from that track. I want to go out to that specific output. So make sure that's on. And when we're sending CC information, control change information, again, we're changing the value of a parameter over time. We want to make sure that remote is on for that output. Now, it's worth noting uh, if we want to control Ableton with something remotely, then we go to the input and we enable remote for that specific MIDI input. 
if I want to sync Ableton to something, we're, you know, we're talking about using Ableton to control stuff, but let's say I want Ableton's tempo to be defined by my uh, metronome, your drummer, you have an external metronome. You want to set tempo for Ableton from your metronome. You would connect the two, you make sure MIDI out of your metronome into the MIDI end of your interface connected to Ableton. You want to enable sync on your input, and then you'd go up here to this EXT box, upper left-hand corner, and enable that, which means Ableton is now going to get its play and song position data from that device, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool option to have available to you. Um, okay, so that is MIDI clock. Let's see, Marcel has a question or a, a statement here. Uh, he's going to use this function to change the notes on Waves Tune real time in each different scene I launch. Yeah, that's great. So uh, again, presets, program change is typically how that works. Uh, Sean, I try this as a test from Ableton, my computer main stage running on my computer for tempo info. It'll be off by, yeah, 0.2 BPM. Is that more likely just a weird delay on my computer? No, uh, MIDI tempo sync it, uh, typically is not perfect, especially when you're sending it from Ableton. Uh, a couple things you could do on the sync side, uh, mess with the sync delay. That could help uh, tighten it up. Make sure you're not doing it over wireless, Sean. Uh, make sure it is hardwired, but you could adjust that MIDI sync delay. I also try to give it about a, a, a bar or a couple beats to get in sync before we start. Uh, and typically that little bit of offset is not going to be a huge problem, I'm, I've discovered. Uh, I'm a bad enough keyboard player that uh, I'm enough off time as it is without the delay. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't notice it too, too much. So um, that's MIDI clock. A couple of really quick things, and we're going to talk about controlling stuff or connecting stuff because uh, we're running out of time. Actually, I'm going to skip ahead for this. Uh, let's talk about time code. This is the mystical thing uh, that everyone's always like, ooh, time code. How do I use time code? I have a tutorial coming out in five weeks, six weeks, where a uh, free tutorial uh, on the YouTube channel where I kind of demystify LTC time code. Here's the quick briefing for you guys. Time code is a simply SMPTE. Um, stands for something, Google it, you can figure that out. Uh, but it's essentially a set of numbers, hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. And that means when this device is sending that information to, uh, to another device, that device is gonna stay in sync because it's always looking at, are we at the same hour, the same minute, the same second, the same frame. Um, so Ableton, uh, there's two versions of SMPTE. There's LTC, linear time code, which is the audio version. There's MTC, which is the MIDI version. Ableton um, natively will send MTC, MIDI time code, uh, when you're on the output of something and you enable sync, just like we did here. Uh, let's get that. And you could go, oh, where is it? I'm losing my mind here. MIDI clock type, come back to me. Output. Okay, maybe I'm losing my mind here. Uh, Ableton could send, or my, oh, Ableton can't send MIDI timecode. Wow, it's been a long day. I'm forgetting that. Ableton can sync to MIDI timecode. Uh, it cannot send it. So for instance, let me show you on an input here. Uh, sorry, everybody, long day. So if I go on the input here and I enable sync, you can see sync type for Ableton MIDI clock or MIDI timecode. Um, and then I could change, what's my frame rate? Uh, frame rate when it comes to timecode, oh, you guys can't see my screen. There we go. Uh, bring the screen back. So uh, on the input, again, as a reminder, I, I messed up there. Uh, Ableton can sync to MIDI timecode on an input. It cannot send MIDI timecode as an output. Uh, so on the input side here, I could hit sync, and then I go and say, okay, do I want to sync Ableton to MIDI clock or to MIDI timecode? It's important to note with MIDI timecode, there's not tempo information inherently in the timecode. It's just uh, song information, uh, but the clock information comes from uh, when you have MIDI clock. Another thing worth noting with MIDI timecode, there's currently a bug that Ableton is aware of. If you want this work uh, working, email Ableton because it helps to get uh, a couple emails in there, uh, where when you sync Ableton to MIDI timecode, uh, it does not follow the tempo of your track, or it'll basically follow the tempo of one track and then gets off for the others. There's some cool possibilities with Ableton, especially at multi-site churches doing point-to-point -point sync when you do MIDI timecode. Again, not MIDI clock. That works perfectly fine. But when you do MIDI timecode, another conversation for another day. Uh, so Ableton natively syncs to MIDI timecode. It does not natively send MIDI timecode. Uh, check out Live MTC by ShowSync, uh, which is a great resource. Uh, they make tons of great software. Hitty and the rest of the gang there uh, do a lot of really cool things. Uh, Live MTC is one of my favorite solutions for that. Um, on the uh, LTC side of this, on the audio side of this, though, 
Um, all LTC, all linear time code is, is audio. So it's a striped audio track. What a striped audio track uh, is, is it's just an audio track uh, with um, uh, linear time code information uh, uh, enabled in it. So uh, Ableton uh, natively does not send uh, time code, linear time code. Uh, a lot of software like Digital Performer, I think Pro Tools even sends um, LTC. Reaper, I know, sends and generates LTC files. Ableton does not generate LTC natively. So what you do is you create an LTC file. All it is is an audio file, so you're going to treat it just like any other thing. You drop that in Ableton, send it out of a separate output of your interface. I'm going to show you a diagram here in a second. Uh, and you may be going, okay, if Ableton doesn't create this, well, I don't have another software that could create uh, LTC. How do I do this? Check out the link to the site I just posted uh, in the comments. If you're watching after the fact and looking at my notes, you could get the link there. Uh, but this is a website uh, that this guy created. Uh, that basically lets you go in and say, okay, what's the frame rate of the uh, thing you're controlling? And again, not what's the frame rate of the video, but what's the frame rate that that software is expecting uh, the, the LTC to be at? You can generate that and set a specific length to it. So I want it to be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is. Generate that from the site. Uh, and then what you do is just drop it into Ableton Live. So I think, let's see if I have an LTC file here. Uh, somewhere on my computer here we go so I'm gonna drop this file in uh, just like this into Ableton um, we're not gonna convert MIDI because I dropped it into a MIDI track so let's try this again we'll drop it into an audio track make sure you guys can see it great uh, and then I believe you're set up to hear this so let's play it Somewhere in the world, someone's VCR just started playing a movie. So that is what LTC sounds like. It sounds like uh, if you're old enough or of a certain age and you remember being on the Internet and your mom picking up the phone and kicking you off the Internet, uh, you would she would hear that noise when she picked up the phone like a dial up modem. That's what LTC sounds like. Live doesn't natively create it uh, or send it. So what you do is you generate it from this uh, website uh, and then you drop it right into your set and you have LTC. And here's the bit of, uh, benefit of this. You drop this right into your file, um, and then you go in, and even as you have a file, you could jump between your locators and your song. Let's say you jump to your chorus, your your time code is going to sync to that um, uh, right away, which is really, really cool. There's a little, maybe second, uh, less than a second uh, of lag there, but it's gonna keep everything in sync. So that's where you would use something like PVP. Someone earlier I know mentioned that they're automating PVP. Uh, that's where you could use PVP. You could use Resolume Arena to sync out to LCC, uh, which is really, really cool. Um, so that's a look at LTC. I know I'm, I'm moving pretty quickly here. Uh, Marcelo says, I've downloaded a Max plugin that creates the Simpty from an audio track. Yeah. So again, my friends at ShowSync, let's actually pull this up, uh, create uh, the plugin called, uh, there's Live Sync, which generates LTC, but only when you're in session view. So if you're using tracks, uh, you're probably going to uh, be over in uh, Clip Simpty. That's one that, that they have. They also have Live Sync, which is cool. So Clip Simpty uh, is going to send uh, Simpty from Clips, um, but it's just as easier and lightweight in Arrangement View to just use a, a striped audio track. Uh, somewhere they actually say in here, uh, if you're doing this in Arrangement View, to just use, um, where is it? Oh, yeah, here we go. Using the arrangement view with linear time code is much easier. Just play a waveform pre-generated Simpty. Here's an excellent tool. I guarantee they're linking to the same site I did. Yes, everyone links that. If that site goes down, please, everyone watching this, uh, donate using that link. Because if that site goes down, shows across the world will cease to exist. Uh, so go to that link and donate. Anyway, if you're in session view uh, doing a looping setup or, or something that's kind of different than tracks, check out Clip Simpty. Uh, great resource if you're in arrangement view using tracks having all the freedom and benefits that come with arrangement view then check out uh, the site I mentioned and drop in your LTC file show sync has tons of really good stuff let's share the link there uh, we also have a discount for from studio stage subscribers to their video sync software which is the best way to use video um, in Ableton live in session view if you're performing over there okay Really quickly, for the sake of time, uh, I skipped MIDI show control. I, I skipped a few other things. We talked about all those in our control types course. Uh, but what I want to do really quickly is talk about connecting all this uh, and making basically making the connection happen. 
uh, from Ableton to different uh, types of software, different types of hardware. Um, let me know what hardware you guys are controlling. So we've talked about software. Let me know if there's specific hardware, Nords, uh, lighting console, um, a video media server, like a green hippo hypnotizer, something like that. Um, let me know in the comments if you guys are controlling any specific hardware. So some of this that I'm going to pull out is from this course on the site, our Making the Connection course, where we go far, far, uh, far, far more in depth about this. And let's get over here so you guys can see this, where we talk through this and walk through lots of different options. Um, and uh, yeah, lots of cool stuff here. So I shared the link to that that you guys can check out if you want to. And I think you can watch the first video there for free to get an idea of the intro here. So let's talk about this though. When we typically talk about um, uh, MIDI, well, let's go back to MIDI connecting uh, a couple different things via MIDI. Um, typically when we talk about this, oops, uh, I gave away the punchline here. Sorry, let me get to the correct graphic here. Stand by. All right. So we typically think about MIDI. We think about this, right? So five pin MIDI, uh, you know, the device on your, uh, uh, the input on your Nord, the output on your iConnect Audio 4 Plus looks like this. This is a five pin DIN MIDI port. Uh, or this is a MIDI five pin MIDI cable. This is typically what we think about when it comes to MIDI. Um, but hopefully you kind of expand your horizons to realize MIDI could also be Ethernet, could be USB. Uh, MIDI is just a standard that is carried over these types of cables, right? So whether it's Ethernet, whether it's five pin, whether it's MIDI to XLR adapter, we talked about in the course how I created a, a MIDI to XLR adapter to where I can send MIDI over XLR. <clears throat> Lots of different options there. But what I want you to get is that MIDI can be carried over specific uh, or different types of cable. It's not just a five pin MIDI cable like we talked about. So here at the most uh, basic level, let me show you how to make this connection happen. So what we need is we need a um, audio interface or a MIDI interface that has a five pin MIDI input and output. I'm not aware of an audio interface that would just have a MIDI output. I've never seen that, but I'm sure it probably exists somewhere. Someone in a marketing department somewhere probably thought that was a good idea, but you need to input an, an output. So on our first machine, our first computer, we're going to have that guy connected. And then on our other computer, we're going to have another MIDI device, um, audio interface with a MIDI input. And then essentially what we do is connect if we're doing this on a computer standpoint. We're going to connect our two computers um, uh, using uh, our two audio interfaces or our MIDI uh, interfaces to make that happen just using a five pin MIDI cable, right? So that's really straightforward, really, really simple to do. Now there's some inherent issues with MIDI and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but before we dive into that again, one more time, I wanna say thanks to my friends at Clark. If you're watching this as a church uh, or someone that has a performance space, a uh, concert hall, whatever, whatever it is, that you're looking to equipped with gear that you can make the connection happen, that you can control with Ableton Live. Maybe it's lights, maybe it's video, um, <clears throat> maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, you want everything to be in sync, you want everything to communicate with each other, then you need to have gear that can do that. You need to have gear that talks well to each other, you need to have gear that's uh, gonna work well to be automated, not just manned by a person. Uh, if you're looking to do that and you're looking for that type of gear, then you need someone that knows gear, uh, knows spaces, particularly in the church world, knows how things are done in the church world. Again, that's where I would encourage you to talk to my friends at Clark. Um, Clark, they just do a really good job, one, of focusing on the relationship and getting to know your exact needs, getting to know exactly what you're hoping to do. And so they'll come out and you see they, uh, they're all over the place, but they fly everywhere. So what they do, you reach out to them um, either at this email address, give them a call. You can also go up here and hit contact uh, and just give them, uh, give them a ring of some sort and say, hey, uh, I would love to, to uh, talk about um, uh, what you guys do. And you can go down here and say web and oh you can't tell them and say maybe you could tell them you heard about it from from studio stage but in the conversation say hey yeah will over from studio stage mentioned you guys um <clears throat> clark what i love about them is they're people that are constantly doing live performance so they're not just going to places and installing gear they're running sound for live events they're doing lighting for live events video for live events so they know what works they know what gear again 
talks to each other really well, and they're a great fit for doing that. So if you are looking for an AV integrator, someone to help you redo your current space, get new gear, head to clark.is uh, just to start the conversation. And again, um, <clears throat> no obligation there to hire them to do anything, but just start the conversation with them and start talking about what you're hoping to do. Um, and I think you're going to be very happy with the results. I've uh, been friends with three, if not four, of the people at Clark for a very, very long time. I know them well. They're great people, do great work. So um, thanks to Clark for sponsoring uh, not just this webinar, all of season one of the podcast, like I mentioned. Uh, you can listen to that from studiostage.com slash podcast. Uh, if you are so inclined, uh, that's been out for three episodes. We post episode four um, next Monday. So we post an episode every Monday, and that's our first interview <clears throat> with a guy I've looked up to for a long time, Andy Hunter, which is great. But again, thanks to Clark for making that happen. Now, before we continue talking about uh, MIDI, I, I want to talk about LTC really quickly because we're going to go deep with the MIDI stuff. I've got a couple videos I'm going to play for you. gives me a chance to rest my voice as you hear it starting to go away. Uh, and, and it's actual videos from our courses that I want to share with you to talk about how to make this happen in various ways. But let's talk about this from... Uh, really quickly from the time codes perspective. So um, LTC, linear time code. So this is really straightforward, really simple. Essentially, what I'm talking about here is let's look at this from a two computer perspective. So in this case, I've got Ableton and I've got Vista um, <clears throat> on two different computers. So what I need is two different audio interfaces. I'm going to send LTC, which again is just a separate um, output, a separate stem uh, from that, that website that we looked at earlier. I'm going to drop that in to Ableton, I'm gonna press play, and in this example, it's routed out of output one. I would probably do output uh, 12 on this guy or output 10, but I've got that routed out of output one, and then that's going into my other computer, into an audio interface over there, uh, and that software is expecting and seeing that. So I would say in Vista, okay, uh, Vista, expect uh, LTC, expect sync on this particular port, on this particular input, um, on the interface. <clears throat> so um, uh, that's how you would set that up. Now, if we're looking at this from a hardware perspective, essentially this is what we've got. You know, same thing, we're running uh, uh, LTC on a Vista console. This is the trigger in input. Uh, and you can see it's basically an audio input there is how we're making that happen, um, which is great. So that's how we do LTC. And again, don't be freaked out by this. It's just audio, right? It's a separate stem. Um, in our uh, separate stem in our set, then it goes out a separate output. Now, um, let's get back to MIDI. So we talked about, if we're doing this over five pin MIDI. Again, we're just gonna use a five pin MIDI cable, two boxes to essentially make that happen. Um, but there's some inherent issues with MIDI. Primarily that, you know, it's a five pin MIDI cable. Uh, primarily that MIDI doesn't go beyond 50 feet, right? So uh, it can, I think I've gotten MIDI over XLR converted to XLR up to like 300 feet, but I use some boxes to do that to power it. Again, another conversation for another day. We actually talk about that in the Making the Connection course, the thing I linked earlier. But primarily MIDI kind of uh, is spec to stop at 50 feet. So for instance, you can't buy a MIDI cable that's 60 feet. So if you need to go 55 feet, 60 feet, you're out of luck when it comes to a MIDI cable. <laughs> and typically I think they stop at about 25 feet. Probably rare you're gonna find a MIDI cable at, at 50 feet anyway. So what do you do in that case? A couple different solutions. Primarily though, um, I wanna talk about using ethernet as a solution to make that happen. So as we talked about before, MIDI is a standard that can be carried over USB, over XLR, over five pin, over ethernet. And in this case, I wanna talk about doing this over ethernet. So um, one of the first ways we can make this happen, and this is the cheapest, easiest way to make this happen. I have a video where I'm gonna walk you through the setup in just a second, um, but it's basically connecting two computers directly using an ethernet cable. In this case, I'm using uh, uh, two Macs, right? Uh, just connect these uh, using a ethernet cable, and we're gonna use the built-in network MIDI setup to make that happen. And this is included uh, free on every Mac. Um, you don't have to pay for this, which is great. Uh, and you just use the network MIDI setup to make that happen. I'm gonna share a video, play a video here in a second. that's gonna walk you through that. If you're on a PC though, uh, I'm gonna post a couple links here. They're gonna show you how to do this, let's pull these in, um, how to do this on a PC. So there's our first link using a software code RTP MIDI. Uh, here's the other one, and this is a software I have used. Uh, I used when I was in Florida and was trying to work between um, Ableton Live and a 
green hippo hippotizer media server fun name to say fun thing to mess with uh but essentially we would use uh ip midi on the pc side of this which was the media server to accept um uh, midi over ethernet from ableton so uh that's one way to do it the other way is you can expand this really infinitely right so here's the same two computers i have them connected though to an ethernet switch and again, I could connect, uh, you know, a, a lot of different computers here. So I could have one Ethernet switch on stage, connect all my different computers to that uh, to make this happen, to have that control happen. So I could have my tracks computer. I could have my ProPresenter computer. I could have my computer. Someone earlier, let's see if I can find who that was, was talking about using main stage. I think it was Sean uh, to control uh, keys in main stage. So you can have your main stage computer all on that same um, hub to make that control happen. Now, for the sake of giving me a break, resting my voice, and I already did the work once, why redo it? I want to play a quick clip from the Making the Connection course uh, where I show you how to set up uh, a network MIDI session and make that happen. So take a look, uh, and then we'll come back, and we've got a few more things to talk about specifically, uh, and what I'm really excited about, how to use a couple different eye connectivity uh, boxes to make a, a similar thing happen. So check out this video, and I'm going to talk about why I prefer to use these eye connectivity boxes as opposed to doing network MIDI, but it's still worth watching. So here you go. One of the easiest ways to send MIDI either between two machines or even over long distances uh, is a way most people don't even know that's built into every Mac and there's a PC alternative. Um, but let's talk about how to send MIDI over an ethernet cable. The way we do this is using something called network MIDI um, or RTP MIDI, which essentially allows us to send MIDI over an ethernet cable and this is really really straightforward um, let, let's talk about how to connect it and then i'll show you how to make this setup happen in uh, between two mac computers now there are some pc alternatives to the tool we'll use uh, to do this on mac that i'll talk about here in a second but let's just talk about the connection for a moment so essentially this is what this looks like we have two mac computers and we run an ethernet cable from one mac into another mac so that's one way we can make this connection uh, again if we go back to the scenario we talked about earlier you're on stage you have both your machines next to you um, and there's a short distance to go this is really straightforward really easy to do the other thing uh, i know a friend of mine steve primo i, I worked with a, a client that was uh, essentially doing this where they had like a i want to say something like a 300 500 foot ethernet cable that was going between machines i think they use some eye connectivity boxes which we'll talk about in a moment but it could be a, a super long of a cable as needed. But essentially the, the idea here is this kind of point to point thing, right? We come out of one machine over ethernet to another machine. It's useful to make a really simple setup. It's useful if machines are close to each other or you have a really long cable. Uh, the big thing here though, is you're not needing to interface with other machines, right? So it's one um, ethernet uh, cable from a machine into another ethernet cable. Uh, to make that happen. Now, the next scenario though, is let's say we need to add more machines uh, into this. This is where we would bring in a network bridge, okay? So in this scenario, same, very similar deal. We're gonna connect both machines, but in between them is gonna be a gigabit ethernet switch. It sounds fancy. All it basically means is it's a hub. You come out of computer one, plug into one of the ports on the network switch, uh, and then out of another port on the network switch to that machine. Now, any machines you add there. So let's say, let's say we're doing a redundant setup. So we have two Ableton machines. Let's say we have another Ableton machine for video, another Ableton or another uh, Mac for video, another Mac for uh, running Jane's Vista. All we have to do to add those to the network is just another ethernet cable into the bridge. It's super, super easy to set up. Again, sometimes we talk about these more advanced things like using a, a Mac to control lighting. Um, we think one, we have to go to school for four years, get a degree and whatever you need a degree in IT, you know, and you become an IT professional and under, in order to understand how to do this. It's as simple as what you do at work every day or at home uh, to either connect to wireless or to uh, wired internet, just an ethernet cable into your hub out of your hub into another computer and again uh to to add more computers to the setup super easy just plug another cable in and you're in to uh you made the connection now so that's the hardware connection right that's how we make that connection between one machine um to another machine using our network hub but let me talk about what we need to do what settings we need to enable uh to make this happen between two machines now i'm going to show you how to set this up 
you uh, again on a Mac using what's called Network MIDI. It's built into every com- uh, every Mac computer. It's free. It's included. Um, it's similar to the IEC driver. We're going to go to the same place to enable it. Now, if you're on a PC, two solutions I've included links to on this. IP MIDI is one. I believe it's a paid solution. I think uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Great solution. I've used this before to basically interface a. Uh, we were actually using a Green Hippo media server uh, that's essentially runs on a PC. We were using that to interface in um, with a Mac that's just using the network MIDI setup built into Audio MIDI. That worked really, really well. The other one, which I have not used, uh, but I see iConnectivity uh, recommend it. I believe I've seen Ableton recommend it, is RTP MIDI. Um, and uh, that's made by the same guy that does. Um, I can't think of it right now, but I think uh, he, he does a lot of other MIDI solutions for PCs. RTP MIDI, IPP, IP MIDI, both function just like audio network, uh, the network setup uh, does in Mac. So what I want to show you here real quick, we talked about the two different ways to connect hardware, show you how to set this up on a Mac uh, using the network MIDI connection. And what I'm going to do is basically uh, just open this up, show you how to make the connection, then show you how to get MIDI out of Ableton through that connection to that port. Now, if you want to go further, then check out our little uh, short mini course on how to connect to Ableton machines, where we talk about a few different ways to make that happen uh, through the uh, the network setup here. Um, so let me show you how we do this. First, audio MIDI setup. Okay, I'm going to open this guy up. If you remember from our IEC course, the using an IEC driver with Ableton Live, uh, then you've probably remember go up to window and do show MIDI studio. Uh, or again, the kind of tip I always mention when I do this is adjusting the MIDI window to only show the MIDI window because that's where I spend the majority of my time. So in this case, similar to the IEC driver, let's make this a little bigger. Uh, <clears throat> instead of the IEC driver, I'm going to double click to go into network. Okay, and so when I double click to do that, what you're gonna see here uh, probably by default is no network. So what you wanna do is hit the plus and create a new network and then you want to click that to enable it. Okay, so I have two sessions, two MIDI sessions enabled and set up here. Um, the other thing, you're gonna see a directory of all the other machines that are connected to the same network, right? A couple other settings you wanna do here, who may connect to me, change that to anyone. Uh, you do want to make sure both machines have a name in the bonjour name field here. The time I've seen this not work is when I don't have a name included there. So you want to make sure a name uh, is included there and that uh, this is enabled. Now the live routing tab, we don't want to mess with unless we're doing, uh, I, I have used this before to basically, I'm trying to think if I remember how I did this. It was at a church in Florida uh, that I went and did a consulting gig for. And I believe we we're sending MIDI from stage <clears throat> to the booth for ProPresenter, right? We we're just using the MIDI network, but then we needed to get MIDI out of that machine uh, into their lighting console. So what we did was basically send it through the network, then use the live routings tab to say, okay, go out of the network and then send that MIDI to this port on the iConnect audio, right? And then that gave us a five pin connection without having to buy another piece of gear um, to make that happen. Now, in general though, do not mess with this. Uh, I've seen some videos where people show like how to set up ProPresenter and they say, route to the IEC driver in the network and then enable IEC driver. No, don't do that. That's stupid. Waste of time. Nice people, but don't do that. So uh, I'm going to delete this session here. Uh, so what I have is one network session who may connect me is set to anyone. My bonjour name is enabled here. The machine you're looking at now is from studio to stage two um, session is enabled. Uh, everything looks good here right now on my other machine, which is to my right. Uh, let me open up the network settings and show you what that looks like. All right, so that guy is open, and if you hear my voice change, it's because I'm looking over to the right here. Uh, that guy's open, and you're, you're looking at that now. Now, that machine is from Studio to Stage 1. So you see in the Bonjour name, it says from Studio to Stage 1. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here I want to point out. You see who may connect to me, anyone, set the same. In the directory, what's interesting on from Studio to Stage Machine 1, which is what you're looking at right now, you'll see the other machine, which was my primary machine, listed in the directory. Now, if I switch back over to my primary machine, same deal here, you see the other machine listed here. Uh, let me show you how to connect this. Now, the way I'm connected right now is just Ethernet cable between machines. Same exact process if there was a hub between. Same exact thing I'm gonna do here, but let me show you how simple this is to make this connection happen. Hit connect. You're gonna see participants shows up here from Studio to Stage from studio to stage machine one is now connected to machine two. If we look over at our other machine, we're gonna see that same connection is happening, right? They are connected. 
That's literally it. That's how we enable a network mini session between two machines. Again, it, it sounds complicated. It sounds like it's going to be difficult, incredibly easy to do. Let me show you one other thing I want to do in Ableton. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into this because we'll talk about this and how to connect two Ableton machines. But if I am using Ableton, that's the focus of everything we do here. This is how it's in MIDI out of Ableton to the network machine. And on the other computer, I just have to set up how I want to receive that. So in this case, I'm going to go into Live's MIDI Preferences. Command comma is our way to get there. I want to go to the Link MIDI tab. Now on this machine, primary machine, I'm dealing with MIDI output. So I want to go to the output section here and under network session one, you see I have all this enabled. Um, it, it depends on what I'm sending, but if I want to send MIDI out of an Ableton Live track, one of the tracks in Ableton to the network uh, session, then I want to enable track on that one. If I want to send uh, MIDI clock to sync Ableton, maybe to another Ableton machine or Ableton to main stage or whatever, then I want to enable sync here on this tab. And then if I want to send control changes uh, or parameter changes from this machine to another machine, I want to enable remote. In the case of this, I'm just going to only enable track for the output there. And then I could create a MIDI note uh, with whatever value I want to have happen here, right? That's perfect. And then final thing here, MIDI 2 instead of IEC driver, network session 1. Uh, again, you could choose what MIDI channel you want, 1 to 16. I'm going to leave that just set to 1 now. But what happens is when I press play, oh, there's our LTC coming back. When I press play on that MIDI clip, that's going to send the MIDI to network session, which is then going to send it here to the audio MIDI uh, set up to a network, which is going to then bring it down on our other machine over here. So again, super simple. That's how we set this up. So so that this can work on um, with an ethernet cable really simply between two machines again as a reminder uh, we could do either computer to computer let's get back over to our diagram here so we wrap up with this just as a reminder we can do computer to computer with ethernet or we can also add in a hub to network multiple machines uh, or to go long distances if we need to and again in this scenario with one cable the cable could be five feet long it could be 500 feet long I'm not sure what the spec is on ethernet or cat6 cable where the the distance is but um, as long the cable as you can get if you're just doing two machines all right so the thing i want to stress there again is it's super super simple to do super easy to make the connection happen between these two dustin is a great question um it says uh, when setting up the network midi do you have to have a switch that assigns ips ip to the computers <clears throat> dustin here's the thing i know nothing about networking other than <clears throat> when I occasionally have to manually change my IP address at church when I'm uh, uh, messing with gear. <clears throat> but here's a nice thing. I've used this on switches that are installed, dedicated switches uh, at venues. I've used this on my own uh, different network switches. So what I use right now is this little Netgear. This is the Netgear GS605. <clears throat> I, this is one of the best things, best purchases I made when I started the company uh, about eight months ago. I went to Best Buy. You probably get this on Amazon. It's like a $25, 30 uh, switch. Five port gigabit Ethernet switch. Again, it's the GS605. I uh, bought three cables. Let's see if I can show you guys that. I literally leave these three cables wrapped up and attached to uh, this switch at all times. I just throw it in my bag and it's kind of messy when I get to this point. But what's great about this is I just plug these guys in uh, and it works automatically on my computer. Now, granted, my computer and system preferences uh, is set up to um, automatically pull a IP address or create an IP address if I go to network and let's share this with you guys so you can see this. <clears throat> I'm using a USB port right now and I just do uh, using DHCP. I, I almost don't want to mention that because I don't want to scare people away thinking you have to have a networking degree or again be an IT pro to, to make this happen. Um, in almost every scenario I've done this, I just plug a cable in, I connect, and it works. Now the times it hasn't worked is when I'm on a, a, a bigger network that maybe has a fire wire, a firewall. Rather, and that's where you want to talk to whoever the IT person at the venue is at your church to basically say, hey, this connection is being blocked. Can you help me with this? But typically it's as simple as plugging that in. Now, what's the downside to that? Um, you know, we I talked about in the description of this, depending on when you saw this, I mentioned uh, show you how to do this really simply with a couple of boxes for my connectivity. And you might be going, OK, why am I going to go spend money on a couple boxes when I can do this for free with an Ethernet cable between my Macs or between Mac and PC? Well, one reason uh, you might be going from a computer on stage to a lighting console in the booth 
that uh, doesn't um, isn't a computer. It doesn't have an Ethernet port. Uh, you need to get it to five pin MIDI to make that happen. The other thing is, uh, again, you may be doing this across a, a distance, but maybe in the booth you, you need Ethernet, but then you also need 5-pin MIDI, but then you also need to connect a controller that can then go back the other way over USB. So that's where I'm a huge fan of using, and I'll show you a couple of these. One, this is the iConnectivity uh, Mio 4, and I'll drop links to this here in a moment. Uh, has four DIN MIDI inputs and outputs. As you can see there, those are uh, those guys. Oh, where are we? There we go. Uh, those are our DIN inputs and outputs. Um, has our USB port on the back, our host port that we can connect uh, on this side. Uh, a little further, there we go. There's our host port. Uh, there's our second computer input if we're using this for redundancy. And there's our Ethernet jack. Ethernet jack allows us to connect this to an existing network that I just showed you how to create an RTP session which is pretty cool. We talk about that in the uh, Make the Connection course. We also talk about it in our Using the Mio 4 and MIDI 4 Plus course, which I'll pop links to here in a moment when I start the next uh, video. Uh, and then here's the MIDI 4 Plus, kind of similar deal, uh, couple more connections. It does iOS stuff. Here's my suggestion with this. When you're trying to decide between these two boxes, on, um, <coughs> as long as you, you don't need the iOS support, go with the Mio 4, it's cheaper. Um, as long as you don't need the audio pass-through, which I almost guarantee and promise you you do not need when you're getting a MIDI 4 Plus, um, then get the Mio 4. Going to save you some bucks. Again, I'll post links to those in a moment. The other thing I'm a fan of, though, is tying these into a Play Audio 12. So Play Audio 12, you'll notice, also has an Ethernet port on the back there. It has built-in redundancy, which essentially means I have two computers that I plug in here. And I think I have a diagram to show you guys this, right? <clears throat> here we go. So I essentially connect my first Ableton machine and my second Ableton machine to this box um, at the same time. And what that means is uh, I can then connect my MIDI controller to, uh, let's say if I'm using a MIDI controller that's over USB, I can connect that to um, the USB port on that guy on a 4 Plus or on a Play Audio 12. And then I can control that uh, and send that MIDI to both machines, um, but then at the same time have redundancy Again, so that, uh, let's get back here. So if one machine goes down, then my other machine uh, can automatically pick up. I can manually switch them. I can automatically switch them. But what I'm a huge fan of doing with these devices is actually connecting a Play Audio 12 um, to uh, either a MIDI 4 Plus or a, um, a Mio 4. And so what's really cool about this, when I connect those guys in <clears throat> and add a MIDI 4 Plus or Mio 4, uh, is I can essentially have, let's see, I think I've got a diagram here. Uh, let's go back to this guy. Oh, that's not the right one. Let me pull up the right thing here. I'll show you guys. Essentially, I could have a setup that looks like this. So there's our Play Audio 12 again. Um, but I could throw in a Mio 4 to this equation like this. Um, and essentially plug my controller in on stage and then have and send from Ethernet uh, from one of these boxes from the Play Audio 12, right? Let's go out of our Ethernet port on the Play Audio 12, and I'll show you this walkthrough in the video here in a second. Out of the Ethernet port on my Play Audio 12, <clears throat> however far I need it to be, up to the booth to then turn back to 5-pin, to go to USB, to another device, to go into a computer. My favorite thing about using these devices, one, you're going to see how easy it is to set this up. Super quick, super easy. You use Oracle, their new software. It's literally one click to make it happen to set it up. <clears throat> And then two, you don't have to connect the network. So especially if you're in a church situation, mobile church situation, maybe you're in uh, an install situation, but you step on stage and every Sunday you've got to remember to hit connect on this machine to connect to the other one. If someone fiddles with it up there and disconnects, you're, you're kind of out of luck. With this, you literally have these two boxes, a Play Audio 12 on stage, a MIDI 4 Plus, Mio 4 somewhere else, and it automatically works. So let me play this quick video. Again, this is from our using, um, actually two courses I'm gonna share links to, as well as the devices during this. Both are controlling Play Audio 12, are using Play Audio 12, and our Mio 4, MIDI 4 Plus course. So uh, let me pull these guys up and get this uh, going for you. Uh, and again, this is a look at uh, how to use a Play Audio 12 and connect it over an Ethernet 
uh, to a Mini 4 Plus or a Mio 4. I think in this case, I believe I used the Mini 4 Plus in this. Uh, but here we go. Take a look at this video and I'll be back here in a moment. Again, I'm going to share some links while the video is going. Okay, so in our previous lesson, we talked about connecting a Mini 4 Plus to the USB host port, which really allows us to add 5-pin MIDI in and out uh, to our Play Audio 12, which is great. Now I want to talk about how to create an RTP uh, MIDI session between these two devices without the need for audio MIDI network. So again, it could be the same benefit of adding 5-pin MIDI in and out, but it allows us to connect via Ethernet. Now, why would we choose Ethernet over the USB host port? Uh, the primary benefit would be um, that it allows us to go a longer distance. So imagine having your playback rig uh, by your drums or your playback rig even off stage, and then you need to get MIDI, 5-pin MIDI, to various locations on stage. So what you could do is have a MIDI 4 Plus by the guitar player, a MIDI 4 Plus by the keys, MIDI 4 Plus by the drums, have them in different locations across the stage, all connected via one Ethernet cable. So if I'm just doing a Play Audio 12 to one MIDI 4 Plus, I can just literally run one Ethernet cable between them, or I can network them in together using a hub. So it's just Ethernet to Ethernet. The real benefit of this, you might have used the um, RTP network session using MIDI network on Macs, uh, for instance, to connect uh, Ableton to, to ProPresenter. That's great, but you may have noticed sometimes it disconnects or sometimes you have issues or the biggest issue is you have to remember to connect. With this, it's hardware and it's literally an Ethernet cable to an Ethernet cable. Route your outputs once and it works. You just plug the interface in and it works. You don't have to connect to audio MIDI network, which is really, really cool. So I'm a big fan of this. So let's talk about how to make this happen. First thing is connection. Now we have outgrown the ability to use the webcam for me to show you this. Uh, uh, I've put up a diagram to show you how I've done this. What you need to do initially is connect your computer to a network switch, your Play Audio 12 to a network switch, and your MIDI 4 Plus to a network switch. Now we could also add in a Mio 4, we could add in another MIDI 4 Plus um, to this, but each one of these devices needs to be connected to a network switch and our computer needs to be connected to that network switch as well. Now I also uh, have my Play Audio 12 connected again to both computers, computer A, computer B, using the USB port. Uh, just as normal as we've done throughout this entire course. Uh, but it's important to make sure the only device that needs to be connected via USB to our computer at this point is the Play Audio 12. Now, the cool thing, uh, this RTP MIDI networks uh, connection is available in Oracle, so we don't even have to go into iConfig to make this happen. Okay, so let's go ahead and open Oracle up. We're going to see the three devices that are connected to my computer right now. Again, the only device that really needs to be connected via USB to this computer is Play Audio 12 at this point. So I'm going to click the RTP MIDI Manager. Uh, and if you have multiple devices connected, what you'll see is your initiator device and then your responder devices. Now, uh, if you happen to have your MIDI 4 Plus connected via USB and not your Play Audio 12, you'll see it swapped where it's showing up as the initiator as opposed to the responder. So make sure your Play Audio 12 is the device that's connected via USB. Uh, now, because I have multiple devices connected to this computer via USB, um, as long as Play Audio 12 is also connected, it's going to show up as initiator. So we have four possible ports that we can connect and create in order to make this happen. This is insanely simple to do. So what I want to do here is hit connect. And what it's going to do is it's going to establish a connection between RTP port 1 on my Play Audio 12 and RTP port 1 on um, my MIDI 4 Plus here. So you can see this is connected to MIDI 4 Plus, this is connected to Play Audio 12. So basically, Ethernet RTP port 1 is connected to RTP port 1 on the MIDI 4 Plus. So what this means is I can go back here now and you can, uh, once this is connected, now I can unplug my computer from the switch. I can unplug each of these from the switch and just connect them via a really long Ethernet cable between them or I can leave them connected to the switch if possible if I want to, uh, which is great. So that works really well. Okay, so I have the connection made, which is super simple. Now, uh, I could do up to three other ports here, three other connections, RTP 1, 2, 3, and 4 if I wanted. But for now, I'm going to hit back. And what's cool about this is that routing is already done for me. So if I go into Ableton now, command comma, go to link MIDI, and scroll all the way down to output. You see I have a lot of outputs showing up here. I want to go to Play Audio 12 USB 109. 
Now, I remember when I did the uh, pro presenter course, or actually maybe it was the, the making the connection course, and I talked about this, and I said it's showing up as USB 109 on my machine. I'm not sure why. Well, if you count up your MIDI ports on your Play Audio 12, you get your eight host ports, then you get to your RTP ports. RTP 1 equals USB 109. I could rename that, and I probably should rename that so that I know what it is, but that's what I need on my main machine. Okay, and on my B machine, command comma, link MIDI, all the way down to output, and we want to make sure, similar to that one, instead of 109, we're going to do 209 and enable that for the track, okay? Uh, again, sync would send MIDI clock, remote would send our control changes out of there. Same thing works as before. Uh, if I'm on scene one, when I play, the MIDI 4 Plus sees that. Uh, if I go to the other computer over here and play that, you're not going to see it, which is great. Okay, so that's our outputs, but how do we manage our inputs? Uh, so how do we make it to where the DMC that's plugged into the back of our MIDI 4 Plus, we can route MIDI from that over Ethernet into our Play Audio 12 to control both machines. First thing I want to do over in Oracle uh, is I want to go and select my Play Audio 12. I want to do select the device. I want to go to MIDI routing. And I just want to confirm that uh, what's coming from MIDI 4 Plus here is routed to that Ethernet connection, right? Uh, and so that looks like that's good. That looks like that is connected. And now I'm going to go back here. And in Ableton, I'm going to go to preferences, command, comma, link MIDI. And on the input side, again, I want to find my Play Audio 12. And I want to enable USB 109. So I hit remote there. Okay, on my other machine, same thing, link MIDI, input play audio 12, 209, I want to enable remote, uh, and I believe, yep, I have my MIDI mapping still there, so if everything works, I can press play, those are going to play, I can press stop, and those will stop. Now again, this is assuming that I have gone into iConfig at some point here, uh, and selected my MIDI 4 Plus. Uh, there we go. Uh, just like we talked about in the previous video, and I went into port routing, and I just confirmed that I have routed my DMC or host one is what your uh, uh, device likely says, uh, and I've routed that to USB device jack one, DIN one. Um, again, as I mentioned in the previous video, you could go to MIDI info, scroll all the way down here and reserve that port, uh, name the port, it's what I did, DMC 60 for port one, and then I went into MIDI port routing, went to USB host jack one and made sure that went to DIN one. So with those settings, these two devices are connected over one ethernet cable. Again, could go to a switch so we have multiple devices or it could just go ethernet cable between devices. So once we make that initial connection with our computer connected to the same hub, we no longer need to leave our computer connected, which is awesome. All right, so again, that's a look at using a Play Audio 12 with either a Mio 4 Plus or a MIDI 4. Again, I'm a really big fan of those boxes. One, they're affordable. It's, you cannot find anything that does redundancy and has 12 outputs and has MIDI control, USB, um, and network <clears throat> for anything close to the price of this box. Uh, and you can essentially travel with this guy and have redundancy. Um, share outputs between machines, do a lot of really, really cool stuff. And again, pairing that with one Ethernet cable, pairing that with a MIDI 4 Plus opens up so many possibilities, whether you're controlling a computer that's off stage or you're sending MIDI uh, from your computer on stage to the booth, to off stage to a lighting console, to uh, a computer running ProPresenter. Or uh, another way to picture this and think about this is let's imagine um, at each kind of location, right? Uh, maybe across stage, I have a Mia 4 Plus connected via Ethernet, right, to my Play Audio 12. And then I have five, or excuse me, four uh, DIN outputs that I can then connect to gear. Then I have another Ethernet cable because I'm connected to a switch that's going to a MIDI 4 Plus up in the booth. And again, that then spits out to four MIDI outputs. Uh, one of my favorite things about um, the... I should about drop that. That would have been bad. Uh, that makes for a great highlight for the webinar. Uh, one of my favorite things about the course is searing, uh, hearing how different people are using um, Ableton in their different contexts. Doug Laws, good buddy of mine, doing some really cool stuff at his church in the Keys. Um, he's got, I think, three if not four different devices all across the stage in the booth controlling all sorts of things. Um, made that initial connection during, uh, using Oracle. 
did some deep dive stuff in iConfig, but worked really, really well, <clears throat> uh, which is great. Um, so Les has a question. I'm going to answer Les's question, and then I have a quick wrap up, um, share one uh, good bit of information, and then we're done. So if you guys have questions, pop those in the chat before we sign off. So Les says, uh, Les says, I'm using Dante, which I've learned that I don't need an audio face to connect with a computer running Ableton. But can I also depend on Dante to route MIDI or do I need a MIDI interface? So uh, if you guys have any questions about Dante, check out the video on this channel called Using Dante with Ableton Live, where I show you how to use a, a, a not free, but about $20, $30 worth of software called Dante Virtual Sound Card or DVS to uh, route up to 64 channels using one Ethernet cable out of Ableton Live to your console, to another computer, all sorts of really cool stuff you can do with Dante. But Les, what's important to know with Dante is there's no MIDI spec built into Dante. What you could do, depending on your setup, is create that network MIDI session and send, <coughs> send MIDI over the same Ethernet port. Depending on your setup, you, I personally probably would not do that because it will muddy the water with Dante. Uh, if you've got your, your, your setup uh, working really, really well, I would leave Dante just going over that network switch and doing that. So less in that situation, that's where I would suggest getting either a MIDI 4 Plus or Mio 4 kind of in both locations that you want to send MIDI, um, connect them via Ethernet. Um, or, yeah, that's what I would do, honestly. I would just skip the the um, trying to send MIDI over the same Ethernet cable. Uh, one thing you could do, Wes, though, uh, again, as my final wrap-up here uh, for those of you watching live, is, again, talk to my friends at Clark, um, who are an AV integrator, do really cool stuff, especially for churches. You can go up to the right-hand corner here of the screen, even though it's covered by my logo, and contact uh, them. Uh, to talk about creating a setup for your church, for your space that works, that allows you to create the connected stage, whether it's using network MIDI, controlling lights, video, or uh, boxes like the Play Audio 12 MIDI 4 Plus and Mio 4. So again, thanks to Clark for sponsoring this webinar. They're what, they are what allow me to do this for free as opposed to charging for it. So say thanks to them on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, whenever you uh, interact with them or see them. So a couple final pieces here again. Uh, if you're still watching, thank you for sticking around. You're going to get a replay to this first thing tomorrow morning in your inbox. So hang out for that. You'll also get a link to my notes with links and all sorts of good stuff there. I'm also going to send you, though, a special discount code for the site. So if you're interested uh, in getting access to our weekly tutorials early, if you're getting uh, interested in getting access to the courses that I showed a few videos from Making the Connection, Ableton Live Control Types, um, then you need to become a From Studio Stage subscriber. That's going to give you access to our community private Facebook group. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts of the subscription. You get access to courses. I post uh, about a course every uh, two weeks. So it's not like you go and subscribe to the Ultimate Ableton Live course that never gets updated. Uh, content's getting refreshed and updated all the time. There's a new course being posted about every two weeks. Right now, I'm in the middle of redoing all our tracks content and starting fresh. Uh, I think it's the best I've ever done at teaching Ableton Live for tracks. Um, easy to understand, easy to uh, easy for me to explain. If you want to get access to that, as well as the community, as well as our weekly call, our weekly call, monthly call, which actually happens this Friday, so you can start a free trial uh, and get access to that call where I'm going to build an Ableton Live set from scratch. I'm going to format songs, build a set from scratch. You can literally look over my shoulder uh, at my screen as I'm building my Ableton Live set. If you're interested in that, all you got to do is start a free seven day trial. Uh, for from studio stage and you can do that by going to from studio stage.com in the upper right hand corner of the screen um, anywhere that you're on the site you can click the start your free seven day trial button to do that but i would encourage you do not do that right now because tomorrow morning you're going to get a code um, in your email that's going to give you 10 percent off that subscription for as long as your subscription lasts um, whether it's monthly annual whatever it is there's also subscriptions available um, if you are a church or uh, an organization that has multiple people uh, in groups of five ten or i can even do a custom plan for you and again you can pay monthly or annually so you can head to from studiostage.com to check that out but again i'm going to send you a code tomorrow so do not sign up tonight 
but if you're interested in signing up, use that code and join us before Friday where I let you take a peek over my shoulder as I build an Ableton Live set. Uh, going to be like this. We're going to go super in-depth, going to have a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Um, again, thank you all for watching. Thanks for hanging out. It's cool to see familiar faces like Les. Um, uh, really, really good, uh, good stuff. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Marcelo, Dustin, Jared. Uh, let's see who else was on here. Janet was here. Janet's a subscriber. Uh, Sean, thanks for hanging out. Andre, Dustin, Chris, uh, The Flash 26, great name. Jacob, he's a subscriber. Thanks for hanging out. Jacob and Joan Jazzy. I think I missed someone at the end. No, Marcelo, I got him. So thank you all for hanging out. Thanks for the questions. If you're watching this after the fact, um, then uh, post a, a comment. Shoot me an email, will from studiosage.com. Uh, but if you want the good stuff, make sure to subscribe. So thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, they didn't ask me to do this, but if you interact with Clark online, uh, I've tried to tag them. Just say thanks because they uh, made this webinar possible. So thank you guys. Have a great night. Have a great weekend if I don't talk to you before then. Uh, and for those of you subscribers, see you guys Friday. Take care. Bye.